Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Rising in Solidarity, Palestine and the Arab Revolution. My name is Shireen, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. This webinar is part of a series organized by Haymarket Books called Until Liberation, a series for Palestine. Uh, this particular webinar is also organized by the Tempest Collective. For nearly two months, Israel has been waging a genocidal campaign against Gaza. During that time, hundreds of thousands of people have demonstrated globally in outrage at Israel's genocidal bombardment of Gaza. In the Middle East in particular, protests have been massive, faced state repression, and evoked memories of the Arab Spring revolutions. In Egypt, for example, protesters marched to Tahrir Square for the first time since 2013. In Jordan, protesters have faced regime and security forces preventing them from reaching the border to show solidarity with Palestinians. The liberation of Palestine has long resonated throughout the Middle East and North Africa region. And the connection is deeper than just sympathy. The settler colonial project of Israel, its backing by US imperialism, and the complicity of the Arab regimes with Zionism reflect on the oppression of the people of the region more broadly. Because of this, one of the long-held slogans of the Palestinian left has been that the road to, Jer to Jerusalem flows through Cairo, Damascus, and Amman, that Palestinian liberation will have to be achieved through regional revolt and revolution. This panel will talk about the inextricable ties between Palestinian liberation and liberation across the region and its relevance to this uh, crucial moment. The speakers today are Hassam Al Hamalawi, Suhair Assad, and Dr. Bana Ghadbian. Hassam Al Hamalawi is an Egyptian journalist and scholar activist currently based in Germany. He's also a member of the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists and was among the organizers of the 2011 uprising in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Bana Ghadbian holds a PhD in ethnic studies from the University of California, San Diego. Their PhD dissertation, Ululating from the Underground, Syrian Women's Protests, Performances, and Pedagogies, looked at the ways women and children in Syria utilized theater, protest, graffiti, and freedom school spaces in the Syrian revolution. Dr. Rabian has taught using theater and social justice curricula at the Syrian Women's Association in Amman, Jordan, and with displaced Syrian and Palestinian youth in the Arab Youth Collective of San Diego, among other places. Uh, Dr. Ghadbian holds a master's in ethnic studies and a BA in comparative women's studies and sociology and is an assistant professor of comparative women's studies at Spelman College, where they also serve as a faculty advisor for the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter. Uh, Bana is a member of the Palestinian Feminist Collective. Finally, Sohair Assad is a Palestinian feminist and political organizer and a human rights advocate. She received a master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Notre Dame, so here is uh, on the advocacy team, or is the advocacy team member of Rawa uh, for liberatory, resilient Palestinian community work. She's also the co-director of the Funding Freedom Project. Previously, Sohair worked in legal research uh, and international advocacy in Palestinian and regional human rights organizations. So let's get started with uh, Hassam discussing Egypt and its connection to Palestine. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Shireen, and uh, thank you, comrades, for uh, putting this uh, event together. Um, usually, the right-wing and the liberal, actually, discourse when it comes to the Middle Eastern politics, whenever Palestine is mentioned, it's usually dubbed uh, the opium of the Arab people, where the Arab regimes, according to this view, they use always Palestine in order to divert the attention of their domestic populations towards outside uh, enemies. Um, but actually, and this is from my own personal experience and, and by facts on the ground, this kind of discourse might have existed uh, in Egypt and in the Arab world, but this was before 1967. Um, in fact, the Palestinian cause is a source of threat to the Arab regimes. It's a source, um, I mean, the Palestinians in the eyes of the Arab rulers are a source of instability. And more dangerously, that they provide a model that the Arab people tend to emulate and, and, and copy. And the Palestine solidarity actions are quickly 
uh, turned into anti-regime dissent. Um, I will be specifically um, talking about Egypt, but I'm sure that uh, my comrades um, can definitely draw parallels. Um, in most of the Palestine solidarity protests that we organized, for example, when I was a student in the 1990s, before the Second Palestinian Intifada, usually the protest at an Egyptian campus or on an Egyptian campus would start with pro-Palestine uh, uh, slogans. And then the focus would slightly change in few minutes into anti-US and anti-Zionist slogans. And then a few minutes later, the focus would start to change into why isn't our government doing enough to help the Palestinians? And then in a few minutes, the focus would further change into and why is our government that doesn't actually want to help the Palestinians is exporting cement to Israel, which is being used in building Israeli settlements. It's opening up uh, an embassy uh, for the Israelis in the heart of Cairo. And other questions would arise. And then a few minutes later, when the Central Security Forces, our militarized police uh, troops, show up to besiege the university, people would start immediately saying, why is our government that doesn't want to help the Palestinians, that's helping actually Israel by exporting cement and by opening up an embassy, is sending us troops to our peaceful protest instead of sending those troops to help the Palestinians. And then with the first baton or the first stick that falls on the head of any protester, that chance immediately starts to become about police brutality, about the nature of the regime that we're living under. I recall well that in, in one of our protests that started in solidarity with Palestine, by the end of the event, we were discussing the housing crisis in Egypt. We were discussing the, uh, uh, the Belharsia disease that was affecting the peasants in Upper Egypt. We were discussing all sorts of domestic issues. So as you can see, Palestine is always a gateway into domestic dissent in, in Egypt and in the Arab world. Um, and after all, the 2011 uprising, in fact, we have to thank the Palestinian cause for it. Um, uh, I, I joined university uh, as a freshman in the mid 1990s. And at the time, Egypt was going through its first war on terror, since we had other wars on terror, you know, I mean, later. Um, and at the time, dissent was squashed from all shades. Um, industrial actions were unheard of. Uh, the labor movement had been destroyed. Um, uh, most of the political parties were besieged uh, or dismantled. Um, most of the professional syndicates it's that organizes lawyers and, and pharmacists and doctors and middle class uh, professions uh, have all been nationalized by the government. Uh, you could mobilize on the campuses, but you cannot mention Mubarak's name. You cannot whisper his name. You could not talk about politics uh, uh, over the phone. And I, I even recall in one of my first protests that I organized in, in the late 1990s, like as soon as I started chanting against Mubarak, I mean, the people behind me started running for their lives, you know, and I was like all alone <laughs> facing the police. Um, so this kind of terror, state terror that existed, how did we evolve from that situation? to 2011. It's actually thanks to the Palestinian cause. When the second Palestinian Intifada broke out um, and the visuals of Palestinian kids taking on Israeli tanks um, were aired to every Egyptian home, thanks to Al Jazeera and the other satellite channels at the time, people immediately, they start drawing parallels. They start saying if Palestinian kids can confront Israeli tanks, then I can confront the police, armored personnel vehicle 
that's out there in my street and that's stopping people and it is abusing people also on checkpoints and and people would draw parallels immediately between Palestine and between Egypt. So when the second Palestinian Intifada broke out, you had suddenly this influx of protests happening mainly on the campuses, uh, in the professional syndicates. In very few cases, these protests spilled out to the streets for the first time probably since the 1977 bread uprising that we had in Egypt. Because comrades, I mean, Mubarak had destroyed street politics in the 1990s uh, uh, in Egypt. Even kindergarten schools and, and primary and elementary uh, uh, pupils, they were taken to the streets. Um, and this phenomena we haven't seen uh, uh, since probably um, the late 1940s in Egypt. Um, and these protests were faced with, with police brutality. The police cracked down heavily uh, on these protests. And then they subsided after one week, um, but then dissent revived once again in April 2002, when Ariel Sharon sent his tanks uh, to Jenin and the West Bank uh, cities, and that's when you had the horrible massacres uh, at the time under the name Operation Defensive Shield uh, back then. And, and suddenly this protest wave got revived once again, and we had for two days uh, running battles with the police around Cairo University, which is located in Giza. And at the time, people dubbed it the Cairo University Intifada. And this was my first time in my life that I would hear thousands chanting against Mubarak. They were chanting, Husni Mubarak, Zayi Sharon, Nafs al Shakl, and Nafs al Loon. Hosni Mubarak is just like Ariel Sharon. He's the same color. He's the same figure. So only two years earlier, people could not whisper his name. And suddenly, they got the courage to take on the police and chant against Mubarak uh, 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 in name um, during the Palestine-inspired uh, protests. Now, the Cairo University Intifada was put down brutally also by the Central Security Forces who, I mean, I was there and, and they were using their armored vehicles to try to disperse us by running us over in scenes that we saw 10 years later uh, during the Egyptian uh, uh, uprising. Um, after the protests were, were repressed and put down, once again, they got revived with the American and the British-led uh, invasion of Iraq in March 2003. Um, suddenly you had running battles from the old Islamic quarter in Cairo where Al-Azhar Mosque is located all the way to Tahrir in downtown Cairo. You had roughly 40,000 protesters. This was the biggest protest uh, ever organized in the streets of Egypt since the 1977 uprising at the time. And people took over Tahrir Square for two days, burned down Mubarak's posters, burned down the National Democratic Party, the ruling party uh, uh, posters, almost managed to reach, to reach the American embassy trying to storm it. Um, and the police repressed the protests brutally, rounded up uh, hundreds, tortured many people, including uh, close friends of mine, and uh, water cannons were used, bird shots, and all uh, uh, forms of repression. Now, all of these mobilizations that have been happening in the streets around Palestine and Iraq created for us this margin that we could start mobilizing against the regime. So it's not a coincidence, comrades, that the Kifaya movement, which is Arabic for enough, was launched in Egypt in 2004, and the, the, the founders of Kifaya are the same persons who led the pro-Palestine and the anti-Iraq war movements in the previous uh, uh, three years. Now, Kifaya took on the Mubarak's taboo and completely destroyed it. They were mobilizing uh, for two years. Kifaya was mainly organizing like 
among the middle class in Egypt, never managed to create for itself like roots among the working class or the farmers. But at the same time, because of uh, uh, the telecommunication revolution and the ability to spread the visuals of dissent uh, and the, the small protests that we were holding, burning Mubarak's posters in Tahrir Square and elsewhere, this revolutionized the public. So again, it's not also a coincidence that the industrial actions wave and the revival of the labor movement started in 2006, two years after the launch of Kifaya. And that's when uh, 70,000, uh, sorry, that's when uh, 22,000 uh, uh, workers in the uh, Ghazl al-Mahalla textile mill in the heart of the Nile Delta went on strike and they won and they triggered the winter of labor discontent in Egypt, where all the textile sector went on strike. And then the industrial militancy started to spread over uh, uh, the other sectors. Um, and this built up a social movement that led to the 2011 uh, uh, uprising. When the uprising started, and I will sum up uh, with this, the Egyptian revolutionaries never forgot Palestine and never forgot this umbilical cord that, that ties the two causes together. Um, several mass protests were organized in Tahrir Square in solidarity with the Palestinians. There isn't a single protest that I've attended throughout the revolution that did not have the flag of Palestine. The Israeli embassy was stormed twice in Egypt uh, in, in 2011. So it's not a coincidence that when the coup took place in 2013 and the counter-revolutionary onslaught started uh, fully fledged, Sisi, our ruler, targeted every single cause that our revolution has adopted. And among them, and the most important uh, of them, was the Palestinian cause. And hence, we can understand why is he taking part in the Gaza siege? Why is he complicit with Israel in, in, in its crimes against the Palestinians? It is the same cause. And we believe that the road to Jerusalem will have to pass through Cairo because we have the biggest clientelistic regime in the region. And it is just as dangerous to the Palestinian cause as much as Israel it is to the Palestinians. And we hope that we would play our part in the liberation of Palestine by at least getting rid of uh, uh, that uh, imperialist client regime in Cairo. Thank you, Hassam. Um, Bana, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so um, before I start, I'm just going to say trigger warning. I'm, I mentioned prison and a lot of things around rape and sexual assault. Um, so if we can pull up my slides and start with the first one. Shocking news. You can have a dual critique of Zionism and Arab dictators at the same time. <laughs> it's amazing, I have to say that, but it's true. So if you can go to the next slide. In Syria, this looks like a few important things. So first, a, a dual critique looks like understanding that Israel occupies Syria and the Golan Heights. The second thing is understanding how the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, targets Palestinians while using pro-Palestine rhetoric to justify its legitimacy in Syria. The third is to understand the kinds of gendered violence the colonial state and the authoritarian state use on Palestinian and Syrian women. The fourth is understanding how prisons, the carceral state is central to both of these struggles. So let's start with the first point, if you can go to the next slide. So Israel actively occupies Syria. Now, first, for people that don't know, Syria and Palestine are one land. The colonial borders that were created under Sykes-Picot were a century ago. This is a relatively modern construct. So. For this reason, Syrians carry dual critiques of the Zionist system that occupies our land and authoritarianism at the same time. So for example, 
March 2011, the Syrian revolution begins. A group of children in Dera write graffiti on their school walls and then are tortured in the dictator Bashar al-Assad's prisons. People take to the streets in places like Dera, Dereya, Banyas, holding roses and water bottles. And the regime police responds by gunning them down. While this is happening in 2011, on May 15th, Nakba Day, and on June 5th, 2011, a th around a um, thousand Palestinian and Syrian protesters march to the Golan Heights near Qunaitra and Majdal al-Shams to protest the Israeli settler colonial entity that's again on Syrian land. Guess how the Zionists respond? They gun down protesters and they injure 350 people and 23 are killed. So one of these young protesters was Khalid Bakrawi, who is a young Palestinian Syrian from Yarmouk, a Palestinian refugee camp in Syria, and the largest Palestinian refugee camp in the world. There's 12 Palestinian refugee camps in Syria for context. So he marched during the Palestinian return demonstration in the Golan. Israeli snipers shot him and injured him. He goes back to Yarmouk refugee camp and becomes a leader in the Syrian revolution. He co-founds Jafra Foundation and helps all the displaced children, Syrian children who are now sleeping in Yarmouk refugee camps in the UN Ra schools. And he helps refugees from Tulaman, Hajar Aswad, Babila. And so the Syrian regime catches what he's doing, kidnaps him, arrests him, and then he dies under torture in Assad's prison two months later. There are so many Palestinian Syrians that have this story. His friends Ahmed Kousa, Bassam Hamidi, were other Palestinian Syrians who fought in the Syrian revolution and then died when the Assad regime shelled Yarmouk refugee camp. So thank you to Nayef who reminded me of these histories. George Talamas, who was another Palestinian Syrian, provided aid to wounded protesters in the Syrian revolution. Adnan Abdurrahman, another one who led protests. And Basil Safadi, who created a secret cafe where journalists could upload videos of the protest and then was imprisoned, tortured, and executed by the regime in Hadra prison in 2015. So you see people like Khalid Bakrawi and all these activist lives who their entire life was about struggling against Zionism, but also against the brutal conditions of Syria's authoritarian government that abuses Palestinians. So next slide. Today in Syria, organizations like Al Mursad in the Golan Heights monitor human rights violations of the regime and of the Zionists. So in 2017, rural people in Jassim in the countryside of Dara played Feiruz's famous Flowers of the City song during an anti-Assad protest to protest Trump's decision to recognize the Israeli embassy in Jerusalem and held up Syrian revolution flags and Palestinian flags saying, Jerusalem is our bride. <laughs> and they also burned American and Israeli flags. Um, so the flag burning is interesting because that's happening right now in Idlib. While they're under Assad bombing and Russian bombing, they're doing flag burnings, burning the American flag and the Israeli flag. Um, and in Sueda, numerous protests recently have taken place to criticize the Assad and Zionist settler colonial entities at the same time. So again, these pr protesters hold multiple critiques at once. Why? Because they experience multiple systems of oppression at once. This is a concept U.S. Black feminist Kimberly Crenshaw created in 1980s, intersectionality, or what Audre Lorde said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So next slide. The Assad regime from its inception has used the Palestinian cause to say that Syria needed to be under a state of emergency. So Syria had one of the longest ranging periods of active martial law in the world from 1963 to 2011. And it was always in case of Israeli attack, we're protecting you by freezing your rights. Now, Palestinian Syrians are second class citizens in Syria. Rezan Ghazawi, who's a Palestinian Syrian scholar and formerly imprisoned by Assad said, being Palestinian in Syria, you're expected to shut up and be grateful. Everyone says, don't you see how many rights Palestinian have? You are exiled inside Syria. And they also pointed out Israel is where Assad learned how to drop cluster bombs and use chemical weapons. Where do you think he got his tactics from? So let's look at a quick history. 
1976, Hafez al-Assad supports the far-right Christian phalangists in Lebanon and commits a huge massacre of Palestinian people in Tel Zatar refugee camp in Lebanon. Tel Zatar was inhabited by 50,000 Palestinian refugees. So for two months, the Syrian offensive cut off all food and basic supplies and shelled them with 5,500 shells on the heads of civilians and murdered over 3,000 Palestinians. At the same time, they massacred Palestinians in Jisr al-Basha and al-Kalantina camps. So Hafez al-Assad also imprisoned Palestinian dissidents in the Palestinian popular community, Fatah and the Party for Communist Action in the 1970s. And his son Bashar al-Assad carried on this tradition. So an oral history of rural Syrians, like Syrians in my family, help us gather off the record realities that Palestinians face. So I wanna share a story of my father's. He was skipping school one day and decided to hop on a train to Damascus when he was about eight years old. And the year was 1970. Black September had just happened. And he got to Majra Square in Damascus and looks up and sees the dead bodies of Palestinian resistance fighters. They had been publicly lynched. So the regime executed them as a message designed to invoke fear in the Syrian population, that this is what you hap happens when you resist an Arab regime. So today in Bashar al-Assad's prisons, the Action Group for Palestinians of Syria has documented the Assad regime has detained over 4,000 Palestinian Syrians. Um, so if you just before October 7th, that was around the same number the Zionists had uh, in their prisons, the Zionists had detained of Palestinians. So we have to talk about Yarmouk camp. Bashar al-Assad uh, besieged Yarmouk camp for two years from 2012 to 2014 because the vast majority of Palestinian Syrians were in support of the Syrian revolution. So they received collective punishment. So they used starvation tactics. They prevented the entry of all people, food and goods. They bombed the hospitals in Yarmouk, all except for one. And they rained chemical rain from airplanes and shelled and uh, launched rockets into Yarmouk camp. So if you see this photo in the right um, that keeps getting circulated and viral on social media, um, people keep mislabeling it and saying, look at these Palestinians in occupied um, Palestine talking about Israel. No, this little still is from a documentary called Little Palestine Diary of a Siege directed by Abdullah al-Khatib about Palestinians in Syria under Assad. And if you can go to the next slide, there's this famous photo of Yarmouk refugee camp that again, that gets mislabeled. And look at the Syrian refugee crisis, people say. No, this is the Palestinian refugee crisis in Syria. This photo was taken by Yuren Ra during a food distribution in Yarmouk camp in 2014. If you can go to the next slide. The overlap of these Palestinian Syrian issues is a gendered experience why because Palestinian and Syrian women experience patriarchal logics of domination and the extraction of feminized lands and bodies. So what do I mean? In Tel Zatar, one of the ways the Assad regime harassed and terrorized Palestinians was by cutting open the pregnant bellies of Palestinian women, and they committed mass rape. So a 2014 report, Sexual Abuse and Detention Centers, talks about the special branch of prison under the Assads that I'll explain in a second called Palestine Branch, Farah Palestine, that is famous for what's called the Ta'zib al mushtarak where groups of young children and youth are sexually tortured together. So some of the most extreme forms of sexual violence. And again, going back to the rural farm working people like my family who were Fellahin, they experienced Zionist bombing of their countryside in Damascus because it was said Palestinian resistance lived in the hills. And my grandmother, while picking uh, you know, crops on her field, uh, was under Israeli bombings um, in 67 and experienced that while she was pregnant. A few years later, she experienced the Syrian secret police, the Mukhabarat, storming her home terrorizing her again while she was pregnant, causing her water to break. So the experiences of birthing people and gendered sexual assault are also something we have to talk about. 
So next slide, if you can. The shared Palestinian and Syrian conditions are not only about dispossession from our ancestral lands, but also experiences under prison. So branch 235, Farah Palestine, the Palestine branch, this is so ironic, was the oldest intelligence apparatus in Syria, founded in 1969. And the purpose was to fight for Palestine. They were gonna um, interrogate Israeli intelligence operatives in that branch. But today is known as the place where Palestinians are tortured. So that in itself summarizes everything I'm saying. Assad claims to fight for Palestine on paper, but in reality targets Palestinians in brutal ways. Um, the number of people killed daily under torture in Farah, Palestine is between 10 and 15 people a day. So this is part of the reason why Palestinians and the Syrian revolution are, came to the forefront. And I want to talk about Talma al-Luhi. Talma al-Luhi is the youngest known prisoner of conscience in the world. She was a teenage girl in Syria who was detained by the Syrian regime because she blogged poems about Palestine in 2009. And some of her poems are beautiful. It says, we will in, in not accept new shame. Jerusalem will not be tran trampled. No surrender of stolen Palestine. Um, and so just all to summarize here, if you can go to the last slide, one thing Talma Luhi on her blog did was write messages of solidarity to majority black populations in Katrina. So I thought it was interesting. She talks about Palestine and she talks about solidarity with black people in 2006 in Katrina. So in summer 2020, I was part of a group of Palestinian Syrians, Alawite, Kurdish, Assyrian Syrians, many of whom survived Zionist regimes, who survived the Assad regime, who survived detention under ISIS, and they created Syrians for black power. And the idea was that we connect the dots between our liberation and that makes us that much stronger. So of course there are Syrians who normalize Zionism and Palestinians who normalize Assad, but we can be creative in our responses to this. The very last thing I'll share is that in 2016, several Syrian displaced people were relocated to San Diego. And the only Syrian organization in San Diego to support refugees had accepted a Zionist grant from the Israeli government. As a response, a group of us youth got together and created another center that we called the Khaled Bakrawi Center. And the idea there was to create a pro-Palestine, pro-Syrian revolution organization that could support the political realities and lives of the people it was for. So we're capable of holding both critiques and when we do, a more holistic vision of our liberation emerges. Thank you so much. Um, Suhair, do you wanna go ahead? Thank you so much, Shireen, Hussam, and Bana. Um, it's very hard to go after Bana. Bana took us to moments that I think are carved in the souls and hearts and minds of each one of us. Those who lived uh, through the Arab revolutions, I'm part of this generation, part of the generation of the Arab revolutions, and for the last years, um, my generation felt that we've defeated, we've been defeated. We've been defeated by the counter revolutions that took over this extreme moment of hope. Um, and I think in Palestine, May 2021, the Unity Intifada had taught us something about reclaiming our unity, reclaiming our power uh, as, as people and taking back our agency. Now, at this moment, we're speaking about in the context of the genocide that is going on in Gaza, where almost 15,000 people were killed and over among them, over 6,000 children were killed. I cannot believe that I'm saying these uh, numbers. Um, and I think in order to understand Palestinian and, and regional Arab solidarity, Arabs and non-Arabs in the region, uh, we need to understand what is the war now? Who's launching the war on Gaza? And I don't think we can uh, start the analysis of the genocide in Gaza by only understanding the over 75 years of Israeli coloni colonization and oppression in a way that is detached from um, 
Israel being a project of colonialism in, in Palestine and in the region as a whole is a European and a US project that is aiming not only at oppressing Palestinians, at taking their lands, forced displacing them, turning us into refugees and fragmenting our community, but it's also aiming at controlling the whole region, controlling our resources, our freedoms and our livelihoods all over the region. And I think this is apparent and very, very, very clear to us from what we're seeing at the same like these days. And it's not only the states, it's not only the armies, that states that are actively participating in arming Israel with billions now and giving the technology that is burying children under the rubble. Uh, and it's not only um, the, the military power and the state's power, it's also the economic power. It's also the complicity of different companies and investors and others uh, in the profiting from experiencing on our bodies, on the bodies of people in Gaza, the way they've experienced it on, on other bodies in the global south uh, and in our uh, region for so many years. Now, I think Palestinians in Gaza are now being punished and they're being punished uh, for their resilience and for their resistance and for standing in the name of Palestinians, but also standing in general in the name of the oppressed and shaking the foundation of this system, which is a global system. Again, it's not only the Israeli colonization, shaking the grounds behind these regimes, behind the capi racialized capitalist system, behind imperial, like under uh, the imperialism. Um, and I think the ones who are complicit now are not only governments or right wings or mainstream, uh, li definitely the liberal com um, uh, discourse and the liberal, liberal institutions are extremely complicit as they've ev they're always been. What we're seeing now, like I just was watching a videos of students in a US university chanting and calling the universities to divest from arms. And you ask yourself, why is a university, an academic institution, investing in arms, regardless of the ongoing genocide? Why is this money and this profit, it's generating profit from killing and experimenting on bodies of people from the global south? And um, to the surprise, it's not only universities, it's human, big human rights, international human rights organizations, boards, it's, it's different institutions, it's the media who is completely complicit in demonizing Palestinians the way it demonized Muslims and Arabs and people, black people and people from the global south uh, by really like not looking at our deaths and even not calling them killing, not pointing to the perpetrator, calling our children people under 18 and, uh, and, and like people 18 and under or teen, like really ridiculously losing the basic, basic, even ethical uh, um, standards of journalism, but even more demonizing and actually abiding and being complicit completely in the genocide. Now, the Arab regimes in, the, in that sense are not only normalizers, are not only historically as Hussam and Bana has described in details, they are complete allies of Israel. And we need to start to say that. We should stop talking only about normalization. We should speak about allyship between those and common interests. And the interest is not only to oppress Palestinians and, and, and to keep Palestinians contained and to end uh, the Palestinian coast through, including uh, the Abraham Accords and other processes that happened in the region in the last uh, few years. Uh, but it's also a mutual benefit, I think. If we look at what's happening, Israel is not oppressing only Palestinians. And I don't mean in the general sense of controlling the resources and, and being part in the region as a colonial uh, power. It's directly aiding these regimes and oppressing their people by military, by technology, by surveillance, by political power. Um, and it's not a coincidence that these regimes that are killing their people, starving them, making them live in poverty, putting them in jails, putting uh, those who resist that oppression is, is fully backed by the US. If you look at Egypt now, uh, the US obviously is part of, of, of this and, and, and doesn't have the political power, not only doesn't have the political power, is benefiting from having a, a leader, in, in uh, a tenant in, in Egypt like Sisi. Uh, and I think when we speak about um, imperialism, we don't pick sides. It's not that this imperialism is good and that imperialism is bad. So imperialism is bad in Egypt and it's bad in Syria and it's bad when everyone is doing it. And I think uh, for many, many years, um, 
these regimes were protected and shielded from accountability, shielded from their people by the same power that is shielding Israel. And the counter-revolution is a product of both these regimes monstrous and deep control, the deep military, the deep system controls that we couldn't uh, push away by just pushing the, the head of the pyramids. It's also a result of direct intervention by these powers to keep these people, uh, uh, and in a way, keep our region under continuous colonialism. Because what are we witnessing? Colonialism is not only the material existence on our land the way we have it in Palestine, which by the way, we have it in other places in the, uh, in the region, but also it is, the absolute control also through racialized capitalism that is implemented through militarization, through different uh, tools that the Arab countries are, are left under and the peoples are left under uh, a way like really despite the fact that there is a claim that colonialism is over. Colonialism is not over in our region if we really deeply and radically look at it. Now, I think what are we really seeing now is from Europe and the US is, as I said before, is the clear manifestation of white supremacy is anti-Muslim sentiments, anti-Arabs, and in general, global uh, the global South. Those who are looking at kids in Gaza being pulled under the rubble and not moved are the same one who were look, looking at Syrian kids drowning in the Mediterranean Sea and looking at people from our region uh, really drowning on the shores of Europe, which actually is the reason and the cause for our oppression and the cause to what happened in our uh, homelands. Now, the Arab Revolution, as I said, like Hussam spoke about how Palestine radicalized Egypt. And I want to say how the Arab Revolution radicalized Palestine. Um, I think as someone who is a, fem a feminist in Palestine, as someone who believes in justice and is part of the Palestinian liberation struggle, I think our understanding of our liberation was many times really limited, limited and really exceptionalizing Palestine in a way. And I think it's a generation also who linked, uh, uh, in a way, the liberation of Palestine into a duality. Either you're with resistance or you're with imperialism and really turning Palestine into questions of generals and questions of uh, statehood and the questions of really systems. When Palestine is the question of the poor, Palestine is the question of the oppressed. Palestine is the question of the people and not statehood. It's peoplehood and not statehood. And again, and in that sense, when Syria happened and when Egypt happened, and when I still remember our hearts, I still remember the tears that we shed. I still remember the absolute rise of hope that my generation uh, felt. And we took the streets. We took the streets for Egypt and for Syria and for Tunis and for Iraq and for every other place that mobilized. But also when we, when we took the streets, we spoke about liberation, liberation from colonialism in the most radical sense, in the most deep sense. And in a way, especially Syria, because some people try to put us uh, in a duality, like if you're supporting the Syrian revolution, then you're therefore supporting Zionism and the US. And many of us had to stand up and say, no, definitely no, Palestine's freedom doesn't pass on the blood and bodies of Syrian people. This cannot happen. And if we want to understand Palestine, really, if we, it's not because we have a good position on Syria, no. If we want deeply to understand the liberation of Palestine, if we want to redefine it to its essence, to the core of that liberation, it is about resistance, but it's about resistance of oppression and all forms of oppression, not only Zionism, but in the general sense, all forms of oppression, capitalism, uh, oppressive regimes and dictatorships and uh, impoverishing people, not only by regimes, but also by economic system that is, uh, we could see its effects uh, on our people all over uh, the region. So in a way, Pal the Arab Revolution redefined liberation for my generation, and it's impacted the way we look at other struggles, at social stru uh, struggle in Palestine, at the issue of class, that Palestine liberation is not only about nationalism, it's in, in the sense of I'm a Palestinian, it's about also a question of class. Who are the Palestinians? What do you, that are struggling? How do we define that? What kind of Palestine do we want to see? Are we looking for a capitalist Palestine? Do I want that? Or do I want a liberated Palestine in the full sense? So in a way, it 
it affected the way we look at the revolutions, but also the way we reflect at ourselves. And we're really forever grateful for that, especially as a feminist, which this revolution impacted uh, the way I look at the feminist struggle. Now, I just want to say that for the last years, we felt that the counter revolutions had defeated us in the in the region, but also in Palestine, by the way, by our political elite, the PA, Palestinian Authority, and different political uh, elite in Palestine. Um, and in a way, our causes were fragmented. Uh, everyone wanted to survive. Everyone wanted their cause to survive. So in a way, there was a feeling that, OK, let me find my allyships by appealing to the powerful, by appealing to the EU and to the states and to the Congress and this and that. And we know now this doesn't work. We knew, but we know even more. This doesn't work. The powerful and those who have power are, it, they have all the interest in keeping us, all of us oppressed under regimes, under colonialism, as under racialized ca capitalism. And the, the bodies that are sweating in labor in, in Egypt with, and dealing with poverty are the same bodies that are oppressed on the shores of Europe and are the same bodies that are killed under the rebels in, 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 in Gaza. And we cannot, we cannot, we can never fragment that. So, um, and I think also another reason was the use and the weaponizing of Palestine by the regimes when people felt alienated from the coast. They felt that it belonged to the tyranny and to the regimes. And I think what Gaza is doing now and what 2021 did and what the Great March of Return and many other uh, stops in, in the recent Palestine history, but mainly Gaza now is proving to all of us that people can are reclaiming Palestine, are reclaiming liberation, are reclaiming what liberation means. And in a way, Gaza now is radicalizing the region and is radicalizing uh, the whole world. So just to, to finish, I think at this moment, um, we cannot keep speaking about transactional solidarity or solidarity with slogans. And I think uh, the moment of defeatism and the moment of counter revolution maybe have freezed many of us and maybe had made us also faced with a lot of political depression and, and a lot of the movement for justice in the region was really struggling in the last years. But I think that what we're seeing in the world, uh, the, the immense amount of solidarity in the region and in the world should really inspire us again. And inspire us again, not only to do performative solidarity, but really deep solidarity. Our allies are creating power. They have the power, are collaborating. It's not only by speeches, by actual material power. So what we should strive to do is actually create our own power, our own material power as people, and to get each other's backs. Not only when Palestine is facing oppression with everyone, is oppressed when everyone is not free. We need to get each other's back. And we need to make sure that the colonizer world, the Western world, the world that is oppressing all of us in the global South, never rests when we are dying, never rests when we are faced with injustice, and that the Arab regimes also never rest when uh, we are killed, but also when our people in general in the region are killed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Th those were such powerful talks. Um, I am going to ask a few follow-up questions. Um, first, uh, you've, you've each talked a bit about uh, solidarity across the region, how Palestine has inspired struggles in Egypt and Syria, a bit uh, the reverse as well, but uh, could you speak more to um, the importance of the regional struggles in Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and beyond <clears throat> sorry, uh, for the liberation uh, of Palestine um, and, and why these are so necessary for the liberation of Palestine. Um, maybe Hassam and then Bana and Suhair again. Well, I think uh, just like what Suhair has uh, stressed in, in, her, um, in her talk, I mean, Palestine is not really isolated from the regional and the international uh, system of power at the end of the day. And we will not see the liberation of Palestine without a regional actually upheaval. Um, because all liberation struggles at the end of the day, they are interconnected. and. It is a matter of survival and it is a matter of 
I mean, if you really want to succeed, we have to coordinate. This is not a luxury to give solidarity to the Palestinians and um, or that the solid or that the Palestinians would extend their solidarity to the Egyptians. I mean, it's not really about favors here or about like some ethical and moral high ground. It is if we want to succeed, we have the same enemy. And if we don't join forces uh, against that enemy, I don't think that any of us will be able to get anywhere. Uh, let's remember that Sisi's uh, biggest backers, for example, after the coup, was the Israeli lobby in the in the U.S. The Israeli lobby in the U.S. intervened on Sisi's behalf to unblock the military, the U.S. military aid uh, uh, to Egypt, which was partially suspended after the coup. Um, also, the Israeli lobbyists in the U.S were campaigning in, and and um, and presenting Sisi as the only alternative that can save Egypt from chaos and from Islamism. Um, they courted Sisi, they backed him up, and again, because they know their interests. Uh, our enemies uh, understand the need for solidarity, sometimes I feel, much better than us. They are united against us. They are in coordination uh, against us. So we also need to coordinate. Yeah, one thing I thought, what I, why I wanted to start with Sykes-Picot and, um, and just mention that these borders are so recent is to remind us that in our region, you know, my grandparents were alive and lived many years before Israel was a, even a thing. <laughs> they lived a time after the French left Syria and before the dictatorship happened. They actually lived a period of democracy in Syria. So our elders remember, the, they have a collective memory of the political freedoms that they lack now. And I think that's really important because when we're imagining that our liberation is possible, we also need to remember that this oppression is relatively recent, and that means that we can find other ways, you know, that we can we can resist. There is a level of like hope that we can have. Um, there's this trend on Twitter a couple years ago that was to tweet as if Palestine were free. And some of the things people were saying were like, I'll take a train from Damascus to Jerusalem. And those are things that my, you know, my grandparents would travel openly. They used to do that. They used to go to Palestine all the time. So we're imagining this future as if it's so impossible, but it actually was possible. And one thing that um, when I was in Greece translating for refugee asylum cases, I met a young Palestinian Syrian who'd never been to Palestine. But he grew up in the town where my family is from in Syria. And I had been to his family's town in Palestine. And he just looked at me. He was a young, unaccompanied minor. And he just said, like, very matter of factly, he was like, well, when our lands are liberated, I'm going to take you to Syria and show you your hometown. And you're going to take me to Palestine and show me mine. And I think, like, that makes me emotional because... He just, you know, if there's a level of certainty of just naming that our liberation can be possible, I think that in itself, having these discussions, imagining together, doing that ide ideating work is a part of, um, you know, how we can get free. And it has started and ended with the story of Palestine for us. Um, I think I, I already like uh, spoke about that, but maybe a little bit more. I think if we look at the history of the oppression and the wars of the United States in the region, the main claim that they were raising is invasion in the name of democracy. And we saw how this ended with millions dead in Iraq, displaced, and the huge amount of destruction uh, that Iraq is experiencing. Uh, and I think the same power that is claiming that is definitely the same one that is keeping this dictatorship on top of these uh, countries. And it's the same one that is arming Israel actively now and is really speaking like the first, uh, the, the speeches that we've been hearing uh, by Biden, it's, it's not news, you know, like we know that about the complicity of the U.S., but they're unprecedented in a way that the U.S. is basically taking the, 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 the 
really uh, a different lead and really active participation in the world as an agent in itself in that in that war. So I think, um, and 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 this was also the approach uh, during the uh, the Abraham Accords and and even the, the these kind of talks where the Arab regimes are asked to compromise in the name of Palestine as they have as if they have anyone's permission or agency to actually do that when we know that they're really not chosen in the free will of their people so in a way the same power that wanted this consent and wanted this allyship and collaboration from this regime is the same one that is making sure to keep them in power and i'm sure to keep them in power not only to prevent the liberation of palestine because we know what the arab uh, people in the region uh, uh, believe and, uh, and know but i'm sure it's keeping them also for other interests of the us and israel in these arab countries and the interests uh, of these regimes so in a way the complexity of the way that oppression is manifested in our region means that as hossam said there is no way palestine could be liberated or we actually radically and deeply free until the region is free and at the same time there is no way the region is free as long as israel still had this power over our region and is still, is still uh, making sure that uh, these regimes are in place. Uh, so in a way, the paradigm that we need to shift is, is, is really, it doesn't matter which regime are you living in our big region. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Israel or the Saudi regime or the Emirati or the Egyptian or the Syrian or other. It's really, if we look at it in a global sense, it's a, it's a way that these very complex networks of power, of economy, of racialist capitalism, these networks of really colonization in the deep sense of colonization are actually trying to take away our agency, to turn us into fragmented people, to turn us into people who cannot really lead their destiny and lead a, a, a regional actual solidarity. So in that sense, I think that's the importance was, again, I. I think maybe Palestinians, we have the trauma of the of Syria, that sometimes we feel too, mu too much that the way our cause was weaponized and centralized on the expense of Syria. So I'm always careful and I always want to make sure that we understand that, again, it's not transactional solidarity. It's not solidarity of the moment that we need right now. It's an actual, true, deep belief, both ethically and morally, but even more, uh, uh, of that it's not possible without that. It's not possible. Liberation is not possible. And I think I want to stress the word liberation, not only for Palestine, but liberation from all sorts of regime. Because part of what we, why we are facing counter-revolution is really stripping the revolutions from their deep sense of the revolutions of the poor and the oppressed for justice and turning them into a really silly liberal understanding of elections and a box that we just choose without the values and the core reason for why people mobilize. So I think when we describe what's happening in the, in the region, we need to return, um, call this struggle also a struggle for liberation. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the Abraham Accords because I think that another uh, you know, the, the latest round of normalization and normalization in general uh, is another factor that, you know, really shows us the importance of regional revolt in changing the balance of, of power and, and, and uh, bringing about or a necessary step for the liberation of Palestine. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to say more about the Abraham Accords uh, or normal, normalization and how that's uh, relevant. Um, I'll, I can just say, like, in a minute, quickly, um, it's not a coincidence when you look at what sort of regimes were were involved in these treaties um, and then uh, look at their regional role. I mean, the UAE and Bahrain, uh, they were among the hawkish forces in the Arab counter-revolution that helped squash uh, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, in, in the case of Bahrain, uh, they did witness a genuine revolt uh, by their people that was put down in a very bloody manner. 
and then it was depicted as uh, some regional conspiracy of proxies for Iran and what have you. Um, Bahrain, which at the end of the day hosts the um, the U.S. Uh, Navy fleet uh, in the region, and it is one of the main centers for clientelism uh, to Western imperialism. Uh, in the case of the UAE, it it financed the Egyptian coup. Uh, it its fingerprints are all over the Syrian counter revolution, in the Libyan counter revolution, and we've seen direct intervention by their troops in in Yemen. Um, their hands are dipped in blood, and it's not a coincidence that these regimes would be. Uh, within the same ditch or within the same camp as the Israelis. Uh, they are their natural allies. I think one rhetoric we're seeing is that, you know, this is a game changer. It's going to bring peace to the Middle East. And it just reminds me of President Carter and the Camp David Accords that is hailed as this great moment of peace. And even now in the U.S., even in the left, people hail Carter as this champion of peace when what he effectively did in 1978 was create the largest normalization that we've ever seen that allowed, that no longer made Palestine an Arab issue or an Arab world issue and isolated Palestine from the rest of the Arab world and made it a Palestine issue. But you also had Sadat kind of sold out Egypt um, you know, to the Israelis and even the 73 attack with Assad and Sadat, you know, I was speaking with my dad about that recently. It was never really about Palestine. That was just about Syria regaining the Golan Heights and Egypt regaining the Suez Canal. And it wasn't centering the liberation of Palestinians. So you you saw how these, these normalization treaties have long roots and allow for the fracturing of the Palestinian liberation cause in a really systemic way. Um, I really agree with Hussam and Bana, and if I might add, I want to repeat, I think a big aspect of what we've seen in the Abraham Accords, we also seen in the guidelines for the deal of the century. And I think the common, uh, the common motivator on all of that first is to make Palestine uh, cause dead, not the cause of the Palestinians, to make it a dead cause, and not only to isolate Palestinians, but to end any sentiments of, of fights for justice or resistance in Palestine or in the region, by also focusing, and if we hear, and I think the question of class and the question of economy is really, really central to what's happening, the collaboration of these regimes on oppression, but also the, 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 the common profit that all of them are gaining from these agreements. If we look at the relationship of the UAE and Israel, you see a huge uh, uh, investment and people moving to Israel and, and vice versa uh, to, to the UAE in, in unprecedented ways. Even uh, 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 one of Israel's manufacturers of arms is was moved to the U UAE recently and it's one of the companies that is directly involved in the technology that is leading to the killing of people in Gaza. So we see a rise of profit. We see a lot of language around development. Uh, uh, economic development and in a way they're trying to tam all our communities and all our people all over the region and it's a tactic that Israel uses and many regime uses. The tactic is not only in like poverty and making people more poor through economic oppression. The way that Israel is, is trying to attract a class of Palestinians in 48 and in the West Bank into normalization, into interest with the Israeli system and colonial regime, it's also a tactic of the Arab regimes. So the way we have the vast majority of the people living under poverty, some elites, economic elites and political elites and elites that are complicit are also dragged to this path of uh, of being complicit through investment and, and economic projects and and other ways of collaborating and in a way also trying to attract the new generation the youth into a path of individualism into a path of not caring into a path of really uh, uh, eventually 
forgetting about the fights for justice and focusing on individual development while the rest of their people really are under uh, extreme poverty and extreme oppression. But what we're seeing now is that it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. No, no, like I'm sure there are people who are still complicit. I'm sure um, there are political and economic elite all over, including in Palestine, that are complicit completely in the oppression. But I'm also seeing the growing, even people that I knew that just two months ago told me, can't you stop uh, struggling? You will never win as Palestinians. As I remember uh, friends from the region telling me that these are the same people now who are taking the streets because Palestine has given them hope. They didn't see that say this sentence because they didn't believe in justice. They say it because they express so much pain, so much oppression. The, the highest moment of hope that they lived turned into the, the lowest moment of despair. And suddenly Gaza, from under the rebels, from all this destruction and pain is giving everyone hope. So I think what we're seeing now is the failure of the Abraham Accord, the failure of the deal of the century and the failure of every process that they tried, these elites, these regimes, these oppressive colonial forces and these capitalist uh, 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 systems try to enforce on us is failing now. Uh, and, and, and Gaza is radicalizing, I think all of us uh, into resisting that, that these powers. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of good audience questions, so I'll just ask maybe one or two more of my own and then turn it to some of the audience questions. Um, you mentioned this a little bit, uh, I think Hassan mentioned this, uh, but could you all talk about uh, Islamophobia and how um, the war on terror has been utilized by, you know, of course, Netanyahu in the US, uh, but also Assad in Syria, uh, Mubarak now CC in Egypt, um, and how that's been effectively utilized to uh, excuse massacres, etc. Um, sure. Um, I mean, in the 1990s, uh, Mubarak used um, the um, the war on terror uh, rhetoric in order to squash all forms of dissent and to present himself and his regime to the international uh, imperialist powers as one with experience in fighting Islamist terrorism. So you should listen to us and learn from us and turn a blind eye away from the human rights abuses. And Egyptian Mukhabarat uh, operatives were dispatched to Guantanamo to help with interrogations. Uh, and Egypt became one of the centers in the global U.S. run uh, extraordinary renditions uh, program uh, at the time when Islamist terror suspects were sent to Cairo in order to get tortured uh, and interrogated. I recall also after 9-11, uh, immediately on the following day, the Israelis tried to present their uh, crackdown and, and uh, on the Palestinians during the second Palestinian Intifada as part of the global uh, war on terrorism. And the Arab regimes also followed suit uh, immediately. Uh, to fast forward uh, a decade later, when the crackdown on the Egyptian revolution was happening uh, following the 2013 military coup, this was also framed by the Egyptian military as a war on Islamism. And the, the siege of Gaza, which was tightened um, much, much worse than it was already, because Egypt has been already complicit since 2007, uh, was presented as a form of a fight against Islamist terrorism because Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood are two faces of the same coin. And actually, it is Hamas that was involved in shooting Egyptian uh, uh, soldiers and officers in Sinai. And there were a wide array of conspiracy theories uh, linking uh, the two of them. And it's a pity that some of the worst expressions and terms um, and practices that are used by the Islamophobes in the West, uh, whether it's in the US and Europe, actually, they it, it these terms originated uh, from the Arab regimes uh, to start with. And the Arab regimes tend to court some of the worst Islamophobes in the US uh, 
because at the end of the day, they are they are not really that different and they are united against us. Yeah, I think we can go back to 1963 for Syria. And I think studying the emergency martial law is so interesting because my mom always says the emergency martial law was enforced because of the three eyes, Islamism, the threat of Islamism, the threat of Israel and the threat of imperialism. So what that meant was basically under emergency martial law, your mail was censored, your communication is censored, they can pick up the phone, listen to your phone calls, you're not allowed to have broadcast and publishing openly. Anyone who consists who constituted a general danger or was uh, determined to be against the security of the state could legally be punished and imprisoned. They, people could not meet or travel openly, they had to be checked any kind of author, uh, authorized investigation of suspicious people took place and um, civilians were not tried in a normal court. They were tried in a military court, the Supreme State Security Court. And all of this was to prevent the secret meeting of the Islamic jihadists, essentially, but also to say we're fighting Israel and we're keeping you safe. And so if we determine that you are a threat to the state's security and you're a general danger, which is a very vague definition, then we can imprison you. And that's why the prison sentences are so long in Syria because you know the idea is that you're supporting some kind of terrorism and we're keeping you safe from that and it reminds me of 9-11 it reminds me of George Bush and the kinds of things that were carried out in the name of keeping people safe um, I'll, I'll try not to repeat but I think like what's uh, what Hussam and Bana said about the Arab regimes is definitely also the tactic and the rhetoric that Israel has been using for years in Palestine. I think uh, many of the changes of really what they call combating terrorism since really many years is really try like took uh, an extreme Islamophobic framework, the same sentiments that we saw in the United States after 9-11, the absolute attack on Muslims and Arabs in the United States, which paved the way to the invasion of Iraq and the massive destruction and killing in Iraq, is very similar to many of the rhetoric that Israel has used in the last years and is in an extreme way using now since October 7. If you follow Netanyahu's speeches, if you follow the channels, uh, the media channels, if you follow a lot of commentators, there is an attempt, and I think also the Arab regimes has done it uh, for many years, there is an attempt to portray the masses and the people who are really struggling for justice, if it's in Syria or Egypt or Palestine, as these barbaric, monstrous, uh, creatures that is coming to you. And it's not a coincidence that the Arab regimes are, were saying that, and in a way we're trying to get the sympathy and the support of the regimes from the West and European and Americans to make sure they stay in place. It's also what Netanyahu is saying. If we follow the speeches of Netanyahu, he said it several times that this is not Israel's war. It's the world war, the war of everyone against this monstrous or otherwise you will see him coming to you. And I think this is the sentiment that um, many of the struggles in our regions in a way were framed, not as striving for justice, but as playing on the existing sentiment of white supremacy, of Islamophobia, of hate of Arabs, hate of black people, brown people, people from the global south that Europe already have and, and what and the white US already have is really exploiting that and using it to ensure that they stay in place uh, as regimes. And I think um, it's it's like even a, I'll give an example. Israel recently enacted a law that basically says that consumption of media uh, material in a systematic way from Hamas uh, uh, um, or ISIS, they didn't mention other Palestinian fractions. They said Hamas and ISIS could make you end up uh, being in a prison for a year, which means uh, most of uh, the people I know uh, who are consuming news and, and learning the news from Hamas. It's not a coincidence that they put Hamas with ISIS. It's not a coincidence that they didn't put other Palestinian fractions. It's really 
deeply going into the narrative, into legislation, and into really creating the sphere and in playing again on Islamophobia that exists in the West. It's not uh, something that only the Arab regimes or Israel are doing. It really exists there. And we see that from persecuting migrants in Europe, threatening them to send them back to their death uh, under the, the regimes that uh, uh, they, they fled from. And really like, uh, like even if you're looking at the attacks in the US, not only Palestinians were attacked, uh, uh, the kid that was stabbed was six years old or the woman uh, who is a Muslim woman who was uh, killed and the three guys who were shot for speaking in Arabic and wearing kufiya, it's not targeting only Palestinians, it's targeting everyone that they suspect to be a Muslim and Arab. So in a way, this is not racism that is, you know, just racism. It's really a systematic deep racism that is serving interests both of the US, of Europe, of the Arab regimes, and of Israel. And we have a great responsibility in combating that uh, and shifting that narrative, especially our allies, especially white allies, who really have responsibility to make this change in their own communities and, 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 the, and the regimes they live under. Thank you. Um, I'll ask, uh, I wanted to ask you, Sohair, uh, if you could talk a little bit, you mentioned, um, well, I, I want you to talk a little bit about the influence of the Arab Spring on, on Palestinian politics. You mentioned this a little bit, but I'm thinking about, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk more about the unity in Tifada or, or Gaza's great return march um, and, and maybe what they could mean for the future as well. Yeah, so I think, as I said before, when the Arab revolutions happened, um, for many years, by the way, not only in that year, is the form of organizing by, by Palestinian youth has changed from very uh, specific organizing, relying on fractions or political parties. Uh, a lot of it became more of a non-centralized organizing, really not a structural one. Uh, we could see changes way before the Great March of Return and way before the Unity Uprising. And of course, uh, over the years and Israel's oppression and the oppression by the PA, they were able to create a type of a counter-revolution that manifested itself in the PA in, in, in the West Bank uh, and in the, in the, uh, in the shape of uh, Arab e elite, economic elite and political elite in 48 that really linked its interest uh, to the Israeli system, including on the local level. So we saw that the same despair that the region went through, we saw it in Palestine. It was really mirroring that dynamic in a different scale and of course with the specificity of Palestine. But then the Great March of Return came in 2018 and the surprise was that Gaza, that is enduring the most pain and the most oppression among us all Palestinians, people didn't march to say in the blockade and the siege only. They didn't march to say we want more aid or we want uh, to live differently. They marched to claim the right of return, which really bringing us Palestinians, all of us, to the first square, to the first uh, the roots and the deep roots of the Palestinian cause, which is refugees and our right uh, to return. When it was forgotten, it was really reduced into a statehood at the beginning in Gaza and the West Bank, later even only in the West Bank on 20, 22%, which we're losing constantly uh, in, in, in the West Bank. And in a way, isolating refugees and isolating people in 48 and people in Gaza, pushing them outside of this framework. So the 70% refugees in Gaza, uh, which are made now refugees again, really brought us all to the source of the Palestinian cause. Another element was, is those who march in Gaza for so many long, uh, for so long, um, the way that the same processes that happen in the region and in general with the left uh, uh, in the world is this isolation from the community, this, iso this, this kind of centering political work in the hands of the elite in a way which lost sight, even when they're left parties, which lost sight of the needs 
the wills, the agency of people. So instead of people being part of the political struggle, being central to it, their pain, their daily suffering, the poverty, the crime, the, the, the daily oppression, instead of it being what defines liberation for us, that what defines politics for us, they were marginalized, pushed away, and they were treated as recipients in, of politics. In the, in the best case, uh, they are just sitting in some talk that some leader is doing. So in a way, turning politics into something that isolated so many people and, and made them feel that politics is a, is a game of power, is a dirty game of power, instead of it being a liberatory practice where people take agency in. Now, what we saw in the Unity Intifada is actually people reclaiming this agency. If you look at 48, who go, who went to the street in 48? It's the poor people. It's, it's the young people who are poor in mixed uh, in Palestinian cities that are now called mixed cities, in really poverty neighborhoods, in the Naqab, in the unrecognized villages uh, who suffer from forced force displacement, in small villages across Palestine. And the ones who are also paying the price in prison are these people. And in a way, they don't have the, the, the beautiful or the perfect way of speaking about politics. Politics for them and why they struggle for them is, is the police being in their neighborhood and brutalizing them, is the poverty, is seeing uh, their loved ones killed. It's really all these aspects of forced displacement, home demolitions, different aspects of oppression from what's considered political and what's con considered not political or social. So for so long, the question of class was attributed to social issues. Okay, they're not a priority. Let's liberate Palestine. Later, we'll speak about women and poor people and questions of class. But what we saw in the uprising is actually the people who are suffering from class oppression, not only by Israel, but also by Palestinian elites, were the one who took the streets, were the one who reclaimed their agency. And I think there is a lot of inspiration coming in that from uh, the Arab Revolution, but also it's something no oppression can defeat. People always revolt against oppression. And oppression is not something that is understood in one way. It's really every aspect of stealing our livelihood, of taking our lands, but also of really oppressing every detail that from economic uh, improvisement, of, of really gender violence, of different aspects of violence, even internal crime in 48, which Israel loves to say that these barbarians are shooting each other, which we know that the source of this is colonial control and really is Israel's complicity, complete complicity in this crime. So I think people started seeing it. Before the unity uprising in 48, there were demonstrations for months against that crime and in a way naming it as a question that we have vis-a-vis -vis Israel and not a social question. So in a way, people eventually claim uh, the narrative for their oppression and claim the tools for their oppression. Now, what we learned from that, because uh, the unity uprising was two years uh, uh, before, and now we're in 2023, I'm sitting in 48, and there's not even one protest in the street. And why is that? I think what we need to work on in Palestine, in the region, is really, really keep thinking about how do we build the infrastructure for mutual care? How do we build the infrastructure for people, we say in Arabic, to have the long breath and not have this, you know, spike of revolution in a moment and then everything collapses is because we don't build properly the infrastructure. Part of it is the complicity of our elite who is not interested in building such infrastructure. And the other part of it is the amount of huge money, and we go back again to money, that philanthropy and foundations and funds and all of those throw back into our civil society, throw back into our elites, not only in Palestine, all over the, the region and in general in the global south, to really tame again our justice struggles into really liberal, narrow discourse that is reformist, that they can tolerate, that they can understand, and anything beyond that that looks like liberation struggle, which Gaza is teaching us now, is faced with immense unprecedented huge monstrous amount of violence and oppression uh, and, and, and pain inflicted on the people who really dare to challenge the basis for these systems. Um, so I think in a way uh, the uprising was an inspiring moment that reminds us that what our struggle is really about, to remember who, who really pays the most prices from it, to center these people, uh, 
uh, they're not waiting for us. They took the agency and they took the centers of the streets, but also to ask ourselves who paid the price who, and who left abandoned and what can we do best to lift each other and make sure we protect each other and have the infrastructure because otherwise it's just going to happen and fade away again. I'm not saying it's, of course, staying in the conscious of every Palestinian, but I mean, if we want it to be an actual material continuous process, we cannot uh, avoid that. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I mean, I can really relate to your point of um, uprisings coming out and then uh, dipping and falling, because that's not only in Palestine, that's everywhere. We, we need to build the infrastructure and organization, uh, long-term organizations for our movements. Um, I, I realize we're almost at time, but um, we have a couple of good uh, audience questions, if I can ask them. Uh, I'll ask a couple and you can take <clears throat> one or, or make a final comment if, you, if you'd like. Um, so there's a question for Bana, which I think really uh, anyone can answer. Uh, given your excellent analysis, do you find it dismaying that uh, there's this uh, axis of resistance rhetoric or an anti-imperialist rhetoric that is soft on Assad right now or Iran, etc.? Um, and then another question, you might have already covered this. Has Syria always had such an aggressive stance vis-a-vis -vis pal the Palestinian population there? Did this begin with Assad? Um, and how were Palestinians viewed and treated by other Arab states before 1948? Um, and then what are the ramifications in the coming months for the stability of Western imperial domination in the region as a whole? Uh, so if any of you want to tackle one or two of those questions or make a, a final comment that you you uh, have wanted to make, uh, go ahead. Um, do you want to do, we, we can go Hassam, Bana, and Sohair again? Um, sure, uh, I, I will leave the commentary on Syria to Bana because definitely she is in a better uh, position and place to answer them. But what I just want to uh, stress in, in my final remarks is that um, on so many occasions, uh, the spread of information was essentially an act of agitation. Meaning when many of us all the time we feel uh, oppressed, we feel uh, put down, we feel repressed um, and we feel that there is a burning desire in order to change our surroundings and our lives. But we we think that we are alone and that we are crazy and that it's only us who are having these insane ideas in, in our heads. So whenever we start seeing people who are flesh and blood like us and usually of the same color of skin as us rebelling and doing something about their situation. So that's when we start reflecting and drawing parallels and saying maybe the insane ideas that I have in my head are not insane after all and that there are other people who are just as pissed off about the situation as, as, as I am. And guess what? They started to do something about it. So the, uh, I'm saying this in order to go back again to the idea that the spread of information is essentially an act of agitation. We need to spread the information about our struggles, no matter how small they are because you never know how they will inspire others into action and spread the domino effect um, when it comes to uh, a revolt. Uh, I'm really honored to be uh, speaking uh, with you here tonight, and I've learned a lot uh, from my comrades who spoke, um, and I hope that this would be the start of further coordination between our causes. I can just briefly talk about this new phenomena of taking delegations to Syria to um, witness uh, the sort of quote-unquote demonization of Assad 
So for example, US-based groups like Veterans for Peace have taken these kind of anti-imperialist delegations to meet with Assad recently um, to answer this axis of resistance question. <laughs> and, um, and one of the men, Jerry Condon, who was the vice president of Veterans for Peace, said that the US is conducting a psychological warfare campaign to demonize Syria's president. We're small voices in the whole thing. We need to become very loud. And similarly, 2019, Max Blumenthal, Rania Khalik, who are kind of well-known Twitter celebrity leftists, met with Assad so that they could get both sides of the story. Um, <clears throat> and they render Syria into this story that needs to be uncovered, and only people from the West can uncover the truth. The actual realities that Syrians are articulating that are oftentimes coming from an anti-Zionist, anti-colonial, anti-authoritarian place are just rendered invisible in that um, configuration. And I think one thing we can do is look at the Iranian revolution um, started by Gina Amini and understand how similarly people in Iran are, you know, protesting and taking to the streets and how this has been made largely invisible, not only invisible, but kind of illegitimate in the discursive schema of a lot of anti-imperialist leftists that really want to see the good in these dictators. Um, and I think recently there's been a rise of social media influencers that go to Syria to prove that Syria is safe. Um, we even saw like movie star Jackie Chan, he decided to go to Hajj al-Aswad, which is an area that was destroyed and pummeled by Assad regime forces to film a movie there. Um, and they're just conveying this idea that the regime has used for a long time that paints them as this rational, secular, leftist government that's fighting imperialism. And again, they say those things in the in the rhetoric and in the image of the regimes, but the de facto reality of imprisonment, of torture, you know, of the working class people will tell you otherwise. And I think it's important that, you know, 89% of Syria now is living under the poverty line. Um, there's a huge class struggle there. The regime represents an elite, um, an elite class of people at this point who are experiencing Syria as completely normal and unchanged. And I think it's a really dangerous kind of image that is recirculating lately. Um, so I hope that answers the question a little. Thank you, Sam and Bana. Um, I really like, I'm still stuck with um, what Bana spoke about before. I'm still stuck with the, the Palestine branch in Syria. I think one of the hardest moments I left during the Syrian revolution is the leaked pictures from that prison of the tortured bodies. And I still remember one body that had the Palestinian flag on it tattooed. Um, so in a way, what these people are asking us, sometimes they're really, it's really appalling the amount of rudeness, white people who were in armies, imperialist armies coming to us Palestinians and asking us to exceptionalize that pain, that to treat that pain as it never exists, to treat the death and the killing and torture of Khalid Bakrawi as it never exists. And we're not going to do that. And we will never, ever forgive that uh, pain and violence that I was inflicted on these bodies and the bodies of Syrians and everyone in our region. And I think when I want to listen to really sincere and honest politics, I listen to my mom, I listen to my neighbors, I listen to the poor people in Palestine, to the people who are really honest and have no interest with regimes or any oppressive forces. And their hearts are definitely with every Arab revolution that would take over any regime in the in the region. Yeah, we all listen to, to our moms. Uh, um, so I would listen to these voices. These are the honest voices who have no interest and are not profiting from the pain of other people. So I think um, despite the immense, like the immense amount of pain that Palestinians and all of us are feeling at this moment, and, and, and this pain, as Hossam said, sometimes not only the hopes, hope makes us feel crazy, 
it's also the pain. Sometimes I'm reaching amounts of really collapsing and feeling pain that I think that we're getting, we're becoming insane. You know, the amount of demonization, the amount of how people look at us, our dead or alive bodies is something that my brain cannot wrap. I cannot wrap my brain around it. Uh, and we knew it again. It's not a shock. <laughs> we grew up in Palestine. I grew up in Palestine and everyone here grew up in our region. We know that. But I think there is some type of really great pain uh, in really getting that level of clarity. But at the same time, there is a lot of gratitude in my heart for this clarity, despite all the price and the pain. And this gratitude is that there is no way back. There is no way back of really fragmenting any liberation cause, fragmenting our liberations, in any way being connected to any source of complicity, of oppression or pain of our people, of our people in the region or of any people. I don't think there is a moment back for many of us. And there is no way back of appealing for humanity or begging for humanity or making anyone understand why are we struggling? How are we struggling? Uh, or, or really, like, if people don't get it, then they don't get it. No amount of information will convince anyone. And actually, when I meet oppressed people who have lived through hells, I don't need to give them any inf almost any information, and they get it immediately. So it's 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 really about that sense of living oppression and seeing that word through that lens. And I'll I'll finish by. What's inspiring at this moment is seeing building power and solidarity on the streets, but power that is really, really interrupting that everything is normal, really interrupting the centers of economy, the centers of politics, the centers of oppression in these capitals. Which is this is what the task now. The task now is not only going to protest in the embassy of Israel or sending your Palestine friend a text message saying, saying that you're with them. The task, the task now for all of us is, is to interrupt these systems of power, to interrupt these places where all the sources of violence, racism, oppression, injustice in the world and in the global south, in the region and in Palestine is originated in. And the way to do that is again. Uh, to build material power, to build power the way they are in coalition, the way they are really generating power uh, and having really armies and billions spending on weapons, they cannot even defeat Gaza. So imagine, imagine how would ever they be able to defeat all of us, all of us together. And this is not only generating power and building material power for Palestine, it's building it for all of us whenever we need it. And it's it's really a process. It's really a growing process that we need to work hard. So when things, hopefully, when there is a ceasefire and we're all praying for a ceasefire, we need to do way beyond that. The question is not ceasefire. The question is the wider context of oppression and colonization and racialized capitalism that we all live under. And if we don't address that root cause, if we don't continue to rally and disrupt those who are responsible for that and not letting them get any moment of peace, we will never be liberated. Um, and liberation is, is, is a long, it's tiring. Um, and one way to really build on that is to start these type of, of conversations. They're really many years late, many of these conversations and many, many years late. Um, but, but, but it's never late to do these conversations. And really, thank you, all of you, for organizing this. This is one of the talks that at this period are very dear to my heart. Um, it really brought um, memories that are painful, but memories that are inspiring. Um, from those we we draw hope at these moments. Thank you so much, Soher, Bana, Hassam. You, this was fantastic and very moving. And the hope is in the resistance. Um, keep uh, keep your eyes out for more of these uh, events. Thank you.